Institute for Creation Research is another great organization. They've been widely published. They have archaeologists and um, people that have specialties in all types of areas of archaeology and geology um, that have devoted their lives to reading the signs from the earth. And they, per, they are constantly published in scholarly journals and they write books and there's just a pile of information out there at your fingertips that you can go and read. Much of it has been kind of what I call dumbed down so people like me can read it and understand it. I'm not a geologist. I'm not um, someone that specializes in this area. Um, so there are people that read these scholarly works and they write it so that laymen out there can read it and understand the data that they present. It's good stuff. And it all points to the fact that there was a worldwide episode, some worldwide event, something happened that destroyed life as we know it, and the signs are literally everywhere. Here's probably one of the most telling things when people say, well, was there a flood? Was there not a flood? Was it a regional thing? Was it a worldwide thing? Did it just, was it a hemisphere and not the other? I mean, what happened? And they speculate about this. But in my mind, here's the most incredible thing. Jesus believed that there was a worldwide flood. Jesus spoke about it. Jesus referenced it. So if the Lord Jesus himself who was there, if he believed that there was a worldwide flood, who am I to say that Jesus was wrong? I mean, the Lord himself talked freely of this in uh, Matthew chapter 24 in verse number 37. He was talking about the end times leading up to what that would look like. And here's what Jesus himself said. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus himself said, if you want to know what the world is going to look like before I come back again, all you have to do is look back in the Old Testament, back in the book of Genesis, go back to the days of Noah, because as things begin to look like they were in the days of Noah, you will know that my coming again is quickly approaching. Well, what were the days of Noah like? I mean, there's the great question, right? Well, we know a lot about the days of Noah. We know that the days of Noah were days of apostasy. People had forgotten God. They were running away from God. They were running away from the things of God. Um, there was a great falling away that was taking place. We know that there were unholy unions that were taking place. People were being joined together in marriage that had no business being joined together in marriage. They were unholy unions. They were unholy gathering together of individuals that the Bible has forbidden to be together as spouses. They were days also of anarchy. We read um, in the account of Noah that every intent of the thoughts of the hearts of men were evil continually. When mankind had a reprobate heart and a reprobate mind, whenever they thought, they thought of unholy things. When they looked at someone, they had impure thoughts. When they thought about something, it was in an unholy way. When they were making a business deal, it was always, how can I cheat to win? If they were looking at relationships, how can I get what I want without any commitment? When they talked about any part of life, any part of their daily life, Life, their thoughts always went in the wrong direction. The Bible says that the thoughts of their heart were evil continually. We see some signs of that today, don't we? I don't think it's as it was in the days of Noah. I think that there's a lot of really good people left in this world. I think there's, there's a lot of good being done in this world, and there's a lot of godly people in this world, and there are people that have good hearts and good intentions. They may not always do it the right way, but their intentions are pure, and they, they try their best to live a life. But listen to this. What about when God snatches them out of this world? What will be left? 
When God pulls his remnant out of this world, all the people that know him and love him, what will be left? People whose minds are always evil, continually evil. People that don't love God, people that don't love anything about God, they don't love the church, they don't have a place in their heart for the Lord or his work. They will have evil hearts that are continually doing evil things. In the days of Noah, moral perversion and moral compromise was rampant. Sin was rampant. Anarchy was prevalent. People tried to live without God's rule, and they tried to live without God's reign. And the same evil moral perversion that reached God prior to the flood, I believe, is starting to raise its ugly head in our world today. Remember, Jesus said that it would be just like the times of Noah whenever he would return again. The days of Noah were days of apostasy. They were days of anarchy. They were days of apathy. People just didn't care. Oh, people were crying out. Noah was crying out, repent, turn to the Lord, and they laughed at him. Some just ignored him. They're like, oh, that's just that crazy guy building the boat in the desert. Why does anybody listen to him? Why is anybody paying attention to that old kook? Nobody listening. He's been doing that his whole life. Rant and rave and repent. Turn to the Lord. Oh, we just get tired of listening to him rant and rave. Kids, stay away from there. Don't go near him. He and his family, they're nuts. Days of apathy. They just didn't care. They didn't want to hear about the Lord. They didn't want to hear about the things of God. They certainly didn't want to hear about the judgment of God until the day the rain started. That changed everything. Instead, in spite of listening to Noah and Noah's preaching, they just yawned, rolled over in apathy they didn't care. They didn't want to hear. They, it, didn't, it didn't move them at all to hear the name of God. They didn't move them to um, hear about the things of God. They just yawned and went on about their day-to-day life. They were absolutely certain that tomorrow was going to come just like today did and just like yesterday. They just knew that they had infinite number of days and they would just keep on coming just like they always had. And that brings us to verse number eight, where it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I want to spend some time today talking about Noah because he's our hero today. But I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about this great ark that he built. You know, the ark was steeped in symbolism. It was a real thing. It was a physical ship, but it also has a lot of symbolism wrapped around it as well. And we would be neglecting um, our our study if we didn't talk a little bit about it. But as always, I never want to stretch a point so far that maybe I'm out of real biblical territory and giving you my opinion. But I I do want to mention the symbolic elements elements around the ark without stretching the point too much, okay? So let's get into the symbolism of the ark. Um, The ark is an object lesson regarding salvation that's available only in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not by accident. Peter clearly tells us that Noah's ark is a picture and a prophecy and a type of a symbol of the Lord Jesus himself. You can look at that later in 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 20. He talks clearly about that. I I hope maybe someday I'll be able to do like a whole series of messages surrounding the ark and the symbolism of it because it's really a great study not only of Noah's ark but of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and how it portrays Christ himself. Remember, friends, all of the Bible, from the very opening pages of the Bible, all of the Bible is about Jesus. The Old Testament foreshadows, it talks in symbolism and in picture and in story about the coming Messiah. In the New Testament, we see his arrival, his advent, and later in the New Testament, we see about his second coming. But all of the Bible 
focuses around the person of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is the hero of the Bible. There is none other. He is the story of redemption that God spoke of from the very opening pages of creation account. Here's a few ways that the Lord symbolizes, how the ark symbolizes the Lord Jesus. First of all, we see the, the substance of it. In the Bible, in Genesis chapter 6, later in verse number 14, God's given him a supply list. And he says, Noah, I want you to make an ark out of gopher wood. Now, gopher wood is what we would call like cypress. It was a wood that was very um, good to be made for things like boats. It would shed water. It had natural density. It had natural oils that would naturally give you a lot of defense against the outside elements. It's still considered to be one of the most incorruptible woods. If you had true cypress siding on a house, I mean, with very little care, that wood will last a long time long time. The Lord Jesus is pictured in the Bible as a tree, one who will grow up out of the root, out of dry ground. Psalm 1 speaks of a righteous man planted um, by the rivers of water. And that's where you find cypress trees. You know, I, just the other night I was watching a show some of you have watched before called Swamp People. Is about a crazy bunch of Cajuns down in Louisiana in the bayous, and they, they're hunting alligators. But one thing you see, every direction you turn are these giant cypress trees. They, they literally grow right in the water of the swamps. And these things have been there for years and years. Some of them have been there for hundreds of years. They're so big you can't even get your arms around them like this. They're giant, giant trees that just grow right out of the water. Some of you have seen the show and you know what I'm talking about. It's just everywhere they go. It's just cypress trees everywhere around the swamps. You see that Jesus, the cypress tree and the wood that God speaks of here, the gopher wood, speaks of the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wood is something of nature. It is something natural. And Jesus himself is that tree that grows out of dry ground. He is that tree that can weather any storm. Quickly moving, we also see the safety of the ark. In verse number 14, it says, Room shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Now, the word pitch here does not mean to throw something. Okay, in baseball, we have the person on the mound, and he has a wind up, and he throws a ball, and we call him the pitcher. He is the guy that throws the ball to the catcher, get it? Pitcher throws, catcher catches. We're not talking about that kind of pitch. What we're talking about here is tar. You remember back in the day when they put telephone poles in the ground, they used something called creosote. Remember that stuff? I mean, it was like a black, thick black tar that was on there. And if you were one of the unlucky people, you would be standing up and up against that pole and you would barely brush against it. And then you'd go kind of go to pull your shirt off of it. Because in the middle of summer, that stuff would heat back up in the sunshine and it became almost like liquid mud. And man, that stuff would grab you and it was impossible. You could use gasoline. It would not take that out of your clothes. You just threw it away or made it a work shirt or something. But that creosote is kind of like our modern day. It's what we would call tar. Just something thick and waterproof that you could put on the outside and the inside of a boat. You just slather that stuff on there and it would penetrate into the wood, but it would also give you almost like a rubberized barrier from the elements. In other words, it would keep water from leaking in and keep your boat afloat. You know, when you're in a storm, it's not about what's going on on the water outside the, the boat that matters. What matters is that that water doesn't get inside. As long as it stays outside and you're inside, you're safe. You're going to float like a bobber on top of the water. But if water gets inside, proportionate to the amount of water that gets in, you start going down. 
So it was imperative to keep water out of the boat. So God said, I want you to take this pitch. I want you to take this tar. And I want you not only on the outside, cover it with this black tar, but I also want you to put it on the inside. Seal it from the inside and the outside. That would keep water out of the ark. Well, the question is, what did water symbolize? What was the water going to do? The water was going to destroy all life on the earth, right? Not like this. Water was a symbol of God's judgment. Judgment was coming. Noah said it for years. Hey, guys, God's going to flood the world. God's going to destroy the earth. You got to repent, 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 repent. You know, God never does anything in this world that he first doesn't warn the world through his prophets. Did you know that? Never has there ever been a worldwide event that God didn't first use his prophets to declare to the people a word of warning and to prepare them for what was coming. Whether it's judgment or grace, God always declares it through his people, the prophets. Even the coming of Jesus, even back in the days of Isaiah, he talked about the coming of the Son of God, the Messiah. He said to whom he would be born, how he would be born, where he would be born, the conditions in which he would be born, what his job was once he was born. Isaiah told the world all of this to prepare the people for the coming of his son. Noah was a voice crying out in the wilderness to prepare the people for God's judgment and God's wrath, and they laughed at him. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. They ignored him. The ship was given by God for protection, for salvation. There was safety in the ark. You know, here's something really interesting. Maybe you've heard this before. Maybe you've never heard this before. This is a fascinating thing. In the Hebrew language, the word pitch that's translated pitch here or tar is the word kafar. It's transliterated C-A-P-H-A-R. Some pronounce it kapar. Some pronounce it kafar, depending on where you come from. That word in the Hebrew language is translated over 70 other places in the Bible as this word, atonement. Same word, pitch, tar, kapar, atonement. When the Bible says the blood of Jesus will make atonement for your soul, it could read this way, the blood of Jesus will make pitch for your soul. It'll seal your soul. It'll protect your soul. It'll prevent judgment from ever coming to your soul. It's the same word that was also translated remission. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no forgiveness. There's no atonement without the shedding of blood. It is also translated, here's another churchy word, propitiation that the blood of Jesus makes propitiation for our sin. It's the same idea. It covers, it protects, it atones, it seals, it, 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 it keeps judgment from coming. Same word used all those different ways, translated differently in your scriptures. The blood makes atonement, remission, propitiation, pitch for your soul. When you read in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You could say without the shedding of blood, there is no covering for your sin. Same word, kapar, C-A-P-H-A-R. Now this is a play on words to help us understand the safety inside of the ark. God tells Noah, literally to cover the ark with atonement. You will be protected as long as you're inside the ark. 
as long as your family is in there, as long as people and animals get inside the ark, they will be saved. It will be safe. They will be inside, away from the judgment and wrath of God being poured out on the earth. The ship of salvation is perfectly safe because not one drop of judgment could get inside. What a beautiful representation this is of the Lord Jesus. One person said, there's nothing that God could not do. The person responded this way. They said, oh yeah, there's something um, that God cannot do. God cannot see my sin through the covering of Jesus Christ. You know, that's true. When you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of the sin in your life, Jesus seals your salvation. You are protected. He covers you with his atonement. And what that means that when God looks at you and God looks at your life from that point forward, God doesn't see that sinful person that is is responsible for evil and worthy of his wrath, what he sees when he looks at you is Jesus. He sees that covering, that atonement, that protection that Jesus brings to your life. It's a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus found here in the ark. Look at the size of the ship and how sufficient it was for this. He says in verses 14 and 15 of Genesis chapter 6, he said, make rooms, build rooms in the ark and cover it outside and inside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. Its width will be 50 cubits. Its height, 30 cubits. Now, They're using their forms of measurement. It's like if I got up here and talked millimeters, centimeters, and all that stuff, we kind of scratch our heads sometimes unless we're familiar with the metric system. Um, We say, well, we, we do standard measurements. We have a foot and we have a yard from the tip of my finger to my shoulder joint is about one yard. My foot is literally about one foot. How do we measure horses? by hands. How, when you say, how big is a horse? They'll say, oh, that horse is so many hands tall. And that's because people, simple people had simple measurements. We said, well, your hand might be a little bit bigger than mine, but there is an average out there. And if I put my hand like that, it's about average. So this is how many hands my horse is. And someone could say, well, how big is that? And they just start going, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. And they count and they said, that's the size horse I want. They use their body to measure. Well, they had a different measuring system there. They had these cubits. The ark comprised of approximately converting what we know about that to what we have today. The ark was approximately 3 million cubic feet of space. That's huge enormous. Has anyone here ever visited the ark exhibit? Okay, several of you have. I've never been before. We need to make a road trip and go see the ark and go experience that as a church. Um, I've just heard it's it's a phenomenal thing. It's huge. It's enormous. And there's rooms according to God's design. God said, do it this way. Make it this way. Cover it this way. Do it this way. Do it my way. Don't, Don't do it your way. Do it my way. My way is the only way. In other words, there was plenty of room for the ark to do everything it was supposed to do. It was fully sufficient to accomplish the task that God had for it to accomplish. I believe that God is telling us when we think about this, without stretching the point too much, there's room at the cross for you. There's room for whosoever believes in Jesus can come. There's room for you at the cross. There's room for you in heaven today. If you'll trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, give your life to Him, there's room. 
God never in this life, God never says, nope, that's enough. No more. No more today. We've hit our quota. There's never any of that, but there will come a time when it is too late. When God says the last soul has been saved, that's it. No more. It's time. When that happens, it'll be too late. We will cross a finish line somewhere out there that I don't know when it is. You don't know when it is. The person that writes all the books, they don't know when it is. Nobody knows. Only God the Father knows of that time. But there is a time out there when it'll be too late forever. When you think about the ship and we see the the size, the massive size of it, and and what it will do, we see the shape of it. This is the most remarkable thing about the ark. Not that it's massive in size, but that the ark has no helm. (laughs) It, It didn't have like a giant wheel. You know, the ancient sailors, they had a big wheel, and as they turned this wheel, it would turn a rudder, and it would help them to guide where the boat went and how to navigate things. You know, if you have a big wave coming, you don't run from it, you turn toward it, and you run right straight at the wave, and hopefully you'll go up, and then you'll come down with it, and you're upright. The ark didn't have that. People have commented about that, that have gone to the ark exhibit. When they saw it, they said, wait, there's no big, there's, where's the big wheel? How did Captain Noah steer the ship? The answer is, he didn't. God did. Noah had no control. All he was there for was the ride. God had everything under control. God knew how to turn the ship. God knew where to put the ship. God knew how to protect the ship. I don't think it was an easy ride. I think there was a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. I think that that thing just listed like that, and then it listed like that, and it went like that, and it went like that. I think it was a wild ride. But God was in control. Have you ever had a wild ride in your life? (laughs) I have. I'm telling you straight up. I've had a couple wild rides in my life. And I don't like being in it. I don't like going through it. And sometimes all you can do is kind of grab onto something strong that you trust and just hold on for dear life. That's all you can do. You just hold on. You understand God is in control. You understand God is in control. And if you really believe that, if you really believe God's in control, then you can hold on and fear not. You can hold on, go along for the ride, maybe take some bumps and bruises along the way, but you know God's in control. And that's that's a great thing to know and understand. The shape of the ark if you ever see it, you know, when, you, when you're there, people have told me that have gone there, it's so massive that unless you stand way back, you really can't see the whole ark because once you get up there, you're seeing only this much what your eyes can see, but it goes so much further away from you than what your eye can see. You have to really step way back to take it in. Here's something though, if you are able to get a view from overhead, like people have taken drones and they've taken pictures and images flying over the top of it, you know what the ark looks like? A big floating coffin. It's what it looks like. It looks like a big wooden coffin. It really does. I mean, you can go online and put Ark Adventure, Ark Exhibit, and they have some images looking down from a drone overhead. It looks like a big coffin. It looks like God could have just buried Noah and his whole family in that thing and just called it done and started over from scratch. It's really an incredible thing. The Ark had three floors in it at different places. This perfectly represents the triune nature of God. We see the Lord's humanity, body, soul, spirit. It also pictures the nature of God who is three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 
But that's not all. The outside, on the outside of the ark was a door, a giant door. Have you seen those on ships where the door just comes down like to the ground and then people walk up on, literally they walk up the door into the ship. That's the way this was. It was a giant door that would have hinged down to the ground and people could walk up and animals could walk up. Now, people always ask me this. Now, there wasn't two of every kind of animal, every kind of insect, every kind of dog. You know, was there a Shih Tzu on there and a German Shepherd and two poodles? And no, that's not how it is. I, and I, I don't want to belabor that, and I don't want to get into all of that. Go to answersingenesis.com or .org, and they have a lot of, they've had books that have been written about this, about what God needed to bring about everything we have. Do you realize there wasn't even German shepherds prior to World War I? It's a breed that we invented. We made the German Shepherd dog. We bred that out of other breeds. And your little bitty cute little Shih Tzu um, wasn't always a little Shih Tzu. It, it was something else that they bred down and bred down and bred like things back together to, to standardize a little bitty breed of mean, yappy little dogs. That's true. But that God only needed a certain number of a certain type to bring about all of that. Now, I don't want to get into that. Just go read that for yourself. But it was very, very, not only possible, it's exactly what God did to bring about everything that we have today. Noah was not able to handle anything that was coming. The door was so large, God himself shut the door of the ark. There was only one way on the ship. That was the door. There's only one way to be saved. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Later, interestingly, Jesus even said, I am the door. I am the door. Jesus uses that symbolism again that I am the door. I am the way to the Father. There's no way but me. Friends, Jesus is God's doorway to heaven. It's the only way to get to heaven. That's a picture of what God does with us in Christ. When we are saved, we are made safe forever. We are protected forever. Does it mean that we're not going to get bumps and bruises along the way? No. Did Noah get bumps and bruises? Yes. Did they get shaken around? Yes. Did they maybe fear for their life in a weak moment? I would guess yes, but God was protecting them, and God was going to see them through to the very end. And when you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have the promise from heaven itself that Jesus will never leave you, he'll never forsake you, he's in it with you to the very end. That's what God does for us. That's what Jesus does for us. You know, the ark was built to sustain them. If you look at um, chapter number six, we're kind of jumping around a little bit. Chapter six and verse number 21. Let me read that to you. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. God had Noah bring all of the good things of this world into the ark. Pick out the very best food, bring it in, not only for you and your family, but we got a lot of animals that are going to be eating something. So he gathered up all the good things of the earth that he could find, and he brought it into into the ship. You know, a lot of years ago, many, many years ago now, decades ago, Becky and I went on a short little cruise Um, It wasn't like a cruise like people do today. It was one of those that just went like from Florida to the Bahamas, and then you got off and you stayed there, and then you got back on the boat to come back. But we were on this thing. One of the perks 
of being on the boat instead of flying over there was that we got all the meals on the ship were included in the cost of us going. So we had a few short hours just to eat like pigs, eat way too much food, but we could just go from buffet to buffet to buffet. It explains a lot, doesn't it? It really, it really does. It explains a lot. I mean, I was like a gluttonous swine on board that boat. I mean, I ate stuff. I ate stuff I didn't even really like. I just ate it because it was there and it was free. We just ate and ate, and ate, or at least I did. I, I won't throw Becky out. Yeah, she ate a lot too. <laughs> we, we both just ate like pigs. We wallered off that boat. I, I can remember standing in line just forever just to sit down. When we finally got to our seat, we had this wonderful meal. Just, you know, my plate needed sideboards around it. I mean, just to hold it all. It was like, it was meticulously stacked. I mean, it was my greatest engineering feat of my life. I noticed on the other side of the dining area were some people who weren't crowded. They were sitting at this oblong table. I mean, they, they, it looked, they had elbow room, and they had a beautiful thing in the middle of their table, and they were dining. They were casually eating. They didn't look like, they, like their plate didn't look like my plate. They weren't crowded together like this, kind of cutting and eating with everybody scrunched in together. They were sitting at this table and they were being served food. They didn't have to go stand in the buffet line like I did. You see, they had the privilege of sitting at the captain's table. Oh yeah, the captain of the ship has his own special table and it is by invitation only. You, I couldn't just walk up in my, my shorts and flip-flops and my t-shirt that said, I'm a tourist. You know, I, I couldn't just walk up there and say, hey, I want to sit at that table. they like, hey, go back there and get in line. <laughs> the captain had a beautiful setting. I mean, it was like royalty, like if the president of the United States was there, he'd sit at that beautiful long table and have all the very best of everything, the best service, the best company, the best food that the ship could offer. Well, friends, let me tell you something. When Jesus saves you, he invites you to sit at his table. You sit at the table of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You get to dine at his table with him You get the very best that heaven can offer for you all the time in the Lord Jesus. I might even tell you, Lord, friends, not only will the Lord save you, but the Lord will satisfy you. You'll never walk away hungry when you eat a meal at the table with the Lord Jesus. He'll always satisfy your soul. You know, the the next thing, the last thing we see is the schedule of the ark. There there was a schedule. God had a time. And I I honestly just discovered this, and it kind of blew me away because I preached through this. I don't know how many times I preached through Genesis, but a lot. And I've studied it even more. In chapter number 8, go to Genesis chapter number 8, go down to verse number 4. Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. Now let, let's look at that again. It's, it's, it's a very specific date, isn't it? It doesn't say when springtime had come, the ark landed somewhere. It doesn't say they could have, but it doesn't. It says on the seventh month and the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. This is God's schedule, God's timing. So what did the good ship that Noah built resting on Mount Ararat, when did that happen? Well, there's, there's a couple things you need to understand so that this will make sense to you. Because nothing, listen, nothing in the Bible happens by chance. When the Bible speaks specifically like this, there's a reason for that. Nothing happens by chance. Here it is. 
in the Jewish calendar, the first month is what we call October. We have a different calendar than the rest of the world. The Chinese use a lunar calendar. So when you get into early spring, based on the lunar cycle, they have Chinese New Year. It's not January 1st. They have Chinese New Year because they're on a lunar calendar. The Jewish people also had a Jewish calendar. They still do, in fact. October is the beginning of the Jewish calendar. So you have seven months away from October is the month of April. Then it says not only the seventh month, but the 17th day of the month, right? I'm, I'm not making this up. It's all there in the scripture for you. So April 17th is the day that it says the ark landed on Mount Ararat. This, April 17th, is exactly three days after Passover. What else happened three days after Passover? That is the day that Jesus came up out of that grave. We call that Easter Sunday. Three days. Now, what? you can't make this up. You, can, you cannot make this up. As Noah and his family inside of the ark rested atop Mount Ararat, And the door finally opens up and Noah and his family come up out of that ark. It is the same day, three days after Passover, that another grave opened up and the Lord Jesus came out of it victoriously. Oh, friends, do you see the schedule? God's timing is perfect. Do you see that? That nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens by happenstance. The ark of God rested on top of the mountain on Resurrection Sunday. Jesus stood as risen Lord. His body had taken the brunt of the storm of the wrath of God on his shoulders. God poured out his wrath. Jesus took your sin, my sin, all of our sin, and God put it on him. He took the brunt of God's wrath on your behalf and mine. And three days later, he came victoriously out of the grave. The waters of God's judgment beat upon the ark of God. And on the day it specifically rested, it rested and Noah came out on top. Friend, when you put your hope and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will come out on top. You will have heaven to look forward to instead of judgment. You will have the eternity with Jesus instead of eternity of torment apart from Jesus. Nothing happens by chance. May I suggest to you, again, without stretching this out, you are here today for a reason. God brought you here today for a reason. You are not here just simply because someone asked you to come. You are not here simply because you woke up in time. (laughs) You're not here because mom and dad made you. You're not here for any other reason except that God ordained it to be so. You are here for a reason. May I suggest to you that the reason God brought you here today is so that you could hear the story of salvation that Noah experienced and that in Christ Jesus, you can also be saved forever. Forever. Your sins can be forgiven 
all of your life can be brought into crystal focus in the Lord Jesus and you can be washed white as snow. If you'll trust him today, he'll save you. If you come to him just with an open heart and you listen, you listen, you listen, listen, just like Noah cried out to the people over and over and over again, repent, turn away, trust God, come back to God. God is using me in a similar way. God hasn't told me to build a boat out here on our property. But the message is the same. Come to God. Be saved. Don't die without knowing the forgiveness of Christ. Don't trust eternity to chance. Trust eternity to Jesus. Trust Him today. You know, people for years and years and years, they listened to Noah. They laughed at Noah. They made fun of Noah. They ridiculed Noah. They ignored him. Some of them probably insulted him. Some of them did a variety of things. But there comes a point where Noah was just told to shut up and let the rain do the talking for him. And then it was too late. I can't begin to imagine the panic that would set in not only as the rain began to fall but as it intensified you know the Bible tells us that the ground started giving up its water not only was there flooding but there was flooding water was coming up as water was coming down all the little tributaries began to spill over their banks. The little creeks became rivers and the rivers became lakes and the lakes became just part of the ocean. It all began to come up. I can't imagine the panic as people who had their entire life from the time they were little kids playing, laughing at Noah, building a boat in the middle of the desert, all of a sudden, they began to come to the realization that Noah was right. I can't imagine the panic as you come to terms with the fact because of your hard-heartedness, because you would not, you would not listen to the message of salvation that your entire family would perish because of you. That's a hard word, isn't it? But that's, that's the truth of Genesis chapter number 6. God has given you an opportunity today to trust Him. To trust Him. To say, dear God, I, I don't have this all figured out. I don't understand all of this, but I know this. I don't want to die and go to hell. I, when I die someday, I want to go to heaven Jesus is the only way, the only way. He's the only way. Let's pray.